I've been in churches my whole life. When I came here, what was the first time he came here? I was th- about 30 years old. First time I came here, it took me about two seconds to say, you're not going to find this on every street corner. I was like, well, you know, wow, you know, this, whew. <laughs> it was nice. But you see, I had some background to think of it that way. And some of the background was in spite of my background, I thought of it that way. And sometimes in spite of that background I had, which sometimes would maybe compromise evangelicalism, I learned many good, good, good things from it. So I had a foundation, but then I realized, yeah, they're teaching me these good things, but this stuff over here, they're, they're going off the deep end. Like, like, so why do they have all this good stuff? And then they're like way off over here. And so that inconsistency, I got used to seeing. And then I came here, and all I got was consistency. I'm like, oh, yeah. But I kind of had the heads up by listening to Pastor Cugini on the radio, but just coming here was an experience of its own. Well, Psalm 115, we are looking at again. Psalm 115. Actually, you don't need to turn there right away. (laughs) We're going to go somewhere else first. Um, And and I'm talking about the subject tonight, which seems like what I was talking about this morning wasn't my intent, but believers need to trust God, which is a little bit what we were talking about last week. But I got some other nuanced angles to present to you that I did not have the opportunity then. And in fact, I wasn't planning on bringing these nuanced angles. But when I said, let's do the rest of Psalm 115, I was going to do, I, and my original title was Psalm 15, verses 9 through 18, because we covered 1 through 8. But then as I again began to work on verses 9 through 18, I realized, well, I can't get to that. <laughs> so... We're talking about believers are to trust God. And as believers, if we're true believers, we do trust God. But maybe not as often as we think, you see. So it's kind of what we're talking about. Last week, as I uh, indicated, we covered the first eight verses of this um, great Egyptian Hallel, the Psalms of Praise, that were used at Passover, during the slaying of uh, the Passover lambs. And when it was all said and done uh, from last week, we learned how to respond to the skeptic. The skeptic that observes trials and tribulations as just part of mankind's life, his existence. And more specifically, more specifically, we learn how to answer the skeptic when he observes, observes the trials and hardships and tribulations that are found amongst God's people. Because when the skeptic sees it amongst the elect, then his antagonism come out, comes out And he says to God's people, where now is thy God? Which we spent a lot of time talking about last week. Where now is thy God? I guess we do want to go to Psalm 115. Look at it again. Psalm 115. I get you going. I don't have you going. Let's go there. Psalm 115. Remember verse 1, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore, wherefore should the heathen say, where is now their God? Why should they have even the opportunity to say that? Why do they have to say that? It's an irritating question to the psalmist. Where now is your God, O psalmist? So he blurts out the answer, really, and that's the way I'm looking at it. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. End of story. And I said, that's a great answer. If you can fill in more details, just let me know next time you check in in heaven at the right hand of God Almighty. Because you know what? That's not what we do. Our God is in the heavens, and he hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. There's your answer. And so that's what we talked about a lot last week. So yes, implies the psalmist, God's children do oftentimes suffer loss and pain. 
They go through trials and tribulations, temptations, and they are often victims of injustice and malice. Yeah, that happens. I mean, Job speaks for itself. You can lose everything with no explanation. And uh, Moses, who never had a home, never. Uh, sent down the river as an infant, grew up in the house of the captors of his mother and father, escaped in, to the pagans for 40 years, then went to get Israel. <clears throat> they wouldn't obey God, so he had to wander in the wilderness with them. Then Moses was kept out of the promised lands. He never had a home, never. But Moses said so profoundly and wonderfully, and no one, there's no one better to write that psalm. The Lord has been our dwelling place. See, now I don't need a big house in Western Cranston. You know what I'm saying? I don't need that. I don't have to have that to know happiness or to find meaning to my life. The Lord's been our dwelling place. Moses was a wanderer, and he had no problem with it. So yeah, but that, that, there, there's a hardship to that, isn't there? I think so. The Apostle Paul, beaten, left for dead. They chase him around the countryside. They put him in prison. They cut his head off. So yeah, I think some of God's people have known trials and tribulations. They stoned Stephen, the Thessalonians. They lived in the tribulation. It says so in Thessalonians, although it seems like nobody sees it. And then Christ. What can we say of Christ? <laughs> the Son of God, who was perfect in morals and love for his neighbor, and came to help all his neighbors, and they crucified him. Yet, in spite of these crosses that sometimes we as God's people may have to bear, we have an obligation to continue in faith and to be faithful in spite of those trials and tribulations. In fact, we need to be sure at those very times when we're experiencing those trials and temptations, it's at those times we really need to put our trust and confidence and God and his word. Those were the times it counts. The in-between kinds, I trust the Lord that when I get in my car, I'm not going to get an accident on the way to work. Well, you also have a little bit of self-confidence about your driving abilities. There's a factor, a little bit of trust there, maybe. Particularly once you start driving down Route 6 in the morning, when they open up Amazon. <laughs> you better find another way to go. You could get killed. When trials come our way, that's when trust in God shows our mettle, shows our sincerity or the depths of our love or maturity, however you want to say it. It reveals our confidence in his love for us, which we should be confident in it because it's proven in the cross. He didn't do that and then just let us out to hang out to dry when his son had to shed his blood on our behalf to make us God's children. So I don't think we're left to hang out to dry. So God's people will suffer, yes. Go to Luke 17. Luke 17. And verse 1. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible. It, no, it is, poss it is impossible, but that offenses will come. 
Yeah, hardships are going to come. It's impossible to think that they're not going to come. He's guaranteeing they will come to his people. But woe to him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. And so many people take that as this is Jesus teaching about how he views children. That's not the teaching. That's children are an avenue that he's using to teach about his true subject, which are the children of God, his people, be they young or old. I mean, it doesn't really matter. Uh, his children. Don't you offend one of my little ones, is what he's saying. Verse, 20, uh, verse 3, take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. Oh, he needs to go to Evangelical 101. No, I think Jesus knows what he's saying. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. You know, correct him. And if he repent, forgive him. And then a lot of people don't like that. Well, if he repent, forgive him. That's what Jesus said. Some Christians think, well, no, forgive him anyway. You show kindness anyway. But don't play the role of a fool. And the guy that, you know, tries to take your head off and then promises to take your family's head off, you're not going to trust him with your family. You know, he, the Lord doesn't want that. If you repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven time, times in a day, see that the crescendo is, the, the, the mountain is getting steeper the higher you go. And, and if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day, turn again to thee saying, I repent, <laughs> I'm sorry. Thou shalt forgive him. That's a lot. Yeah, that guy's a loser. Hey, oh, I am sorry. No, he's a real idiot. Hey, oh, I'm sorry. Well, all oh, seven times in a day? That's what Jesus said. So look how the apostles respond to him. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. <coughs> Which I think is an appropriate reply. <clears throat> the obligation here placed before uh, Jesus' disciples to them seems to be insurmountable. Um, it seems to require divine intervention. Wait a minute. The guy sins against me, not once, not twice, but seven times in one day? And he keeps saying to me, I'm sorry. And if he repents, you're, I'm supposed to forgive him seven times in one day? That's what Jesus said. And the, the apostles said, you know, if we take him seriously. I don't know that I can do that. This is going to take faith. It seems like bigger than what I have, if I'm honest with myself. So they just said, simply said, Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> increase our faith. Well, just remember, faith is not a merit. We show enough of it, then the right magic happens. No, faith is a gift from God. There are certain things we can do to put a blockade up so that we don't receive that gift. But we just don't snatch, uh, uh, snag it anytime we feel like it. But faith is a gift from God. So Jesus explained to them something very important. They said, Lord, increase our faith. How can we have this kind of grace when people so offend us? We don't know even know how to do that. Lord, increase our faith. In verse 6, and the Lord said, if he had faith as a grain of mustard seed. See, they said, Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if he had faith as a grain of a mustard seed. Ye might say to the sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, 
and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. In other words, what Jesus is saying is faith is what will see you through any obstacle that's in your way to do my will. You trust me. And if I'm saying that sycamine tree is in the way, it's going in the, the sea over there. The answer to your problems and the mountains in front of you is trust in me. I mean, that's throughout the whole Bible, the, the history of the is Old Testament, Israel, and everything, right? So faith is what will bring you through whatever comes your way. And sometimes, what comes our way? Trials and tribulations. Those are the mountains that come before us. Trials and tribulations come our way. Well, if the Lord is our God, and he is, and if all things work together for good to them that love God, and that's true, and if God is sovereign over all things, and he is, then the way to, the way to prosper through those trials and to have victory is through faith, through trusting in God's providence to accomplish his good in us and through us. We just say, okay, Lord, I guess I'll find out how this goes, but I'll do as you say. That's the answer, trusting him. Now, let me give you an illustration to kind of like, sometimes illustrations are just meant to, you get the point, but then you got to make it real, you know, kind of make it human. <clears throat> if anyone has ever gone through an extended period of financial struggle, that's a, you know, there's all sorts of examples we can give of this, but that's a, a unique, it's not unique in humanity, particularly not now, but um, it's a, a very special kind of trial. If someone is going through a serious financial trouble, for a long period of time, um, those people know how hard that can be. People that never really experienced it hard and long only have an idea. Um, you end up having bills. There's maybe money that you owe to other people, and you don't have the money to pay those bills or those people. I mean, you got electric bills. Get your insurance bills. You got to rent a mortgage, your property taxes, all to support, as Pastor Cugini would say, the house that Marx built, <clears throat> the synagogue of Satan. <laughs> you got all these bills, and then maybe things are so bad that you begin to borrow money from family, and you didn't really want to do that because you're not sure how you're going to pay them back. But if you don't, you're out in the street. Whatever situation that got you there, that's, that's the situation. And that's stressful. And that brings out a lot of worry, and people say, well, how come that guy isn't so cheery? He's just a miserable person. Yeah, you, have, you got a comfortable home? Yeah, you got, is your life pretty good? Is your kind of family generally in order? You're kind of healthy and everything? Then knock it off. Let the, get, cut the guy some slack. You're not living his life. What would you do if you were in a situation? Now, when people get in these situations, it's hard. It's not like, uh, uh, I didn't get my paycheck this week. No, I'm talking about something that can go on for months and years. And you can see there's a freight train coming. And you know it's going to make you distinct from all your friends. And your spending's been very tight. You've been thrifty. You only, the bare, bare basic necessities, and yet you still find yourself in this situation. You don't like to say it out loud, but you, you say, I feel like a loser. You think my friends will think that. And throughout all of this, to add misery upon woe, you're a Christian. And you've been faithful to serve the Lord 
in every way you knew how. Not that you've done it perfectly, but you've done it sincerely. And no one would really contest that. And you've delighted yourself in his word. It wasn't just going through the motions. Like, I went to church. Oh, God owes me. It's not like that. You wouldn't even think of it that way. You delighted in the word of God and in the truth. And yet you're in this situation and you're at the end of the line. And you've been praying and praying and praying. How many times have I prayed this prayer? And so there's a little quiet, unspoken question that creeps into your mind. Where is now my God? Remember the, the book of the letters written from the Ukraine? The collectivization of the Soviets? These people writing back, looking for Christians to help them, and they were starving to death. Well, they must be weak in faith. So the question comes in quietly, and no one hears it, but you do. Where is now my God? And when you hear it in your own mind, you chasten yourself severely for even hearing it. And your faith almost immediately enables you to beat the question down. And you're resolved with a stiff upper lip and God's help and grace to continue to trust him in spite of that. And you do. You do continue to trust him. For a while. And then something else comes, you know. Maybe you've lost your job, you've lost your home. You have some health problems, you can't pay your bills. It's all coming down to the end. And now some say some, and this is, this is very common in America, some medical emergency hits. You lost your insurance. You're hospitalized for a few days. And you've been so worried, you, got, like, you can't even eat food now. Right? You don't have much to eat anyway. But you can't even eat food because it doesn't digest right because you're so nervous and worried. You got long term, they're all long term worries. And now you've gone to the hospital and you, you come out and you find, oh yeah, you owe tens of thousands of dollars in addition to the other th smaller things you couldn't pay for. Where is now thy God? The voice comes calling once again to your conscience. Well, here's the question. Is faith in God, trusting the Lord, really the answer to this man's dilemma? Yes, it is. But it may require of you to wait upon the Lord. Now, let's see an example of this. Go to 2 Kings 4. By the way, this, this could become more relatable to more people as time goes by based on the trajectory of what this country is doing, committing suicide the way they are. So it seems like without divine intervention, that's exactly what's going to happen. This will be like the average story. Second Kings 4, you say, that's very pessimistic. It's realistic, not pessimistic. Now, I'm not saying we can't stop it. But we can't be fooling around with a little bit of incrementalism, I'll tell you that much. Second Kings chapter 4. <laughs> there's so much to preach on, you know. <laughs> there's, there's, there's too much. <laughs> Second Kings 4. You know, if we preach the spiritual principles, make the application to a whole bunch of areas. Yeah. I'll try and make as many applications as I can for you, but you've got to fill in the blanks yourself. Verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. 
and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen or slaves. Oh, left five minutes. I was just describing them. This woman, now I want you to, let's, let's appreciate her situation. Just remove all the other stuff. Her husband's dead. She lost her husband. You know, that in and of itself, probably, uh, I, I suppose, unless a family loses like a young child or something like that, but in most cases, that's probably the greatest trauma that a husband or wife could ever face, and that is to lose a spouse. Just in and of itself. Been dependent on each other, say, for 60 years. And now, all of a sudden, there's one gone. Well, I, I, I'm not, you don't know what to do. This woman lost her husband to death. But let's add to her misery. Her husband was a prophet of God who was a pupil of Elisha. He was one of the sons of the prophets. It's like when Paul says, Timothy, my son. Well, Paul isn't saying he was, you know, philandering on the side with some woman in the community and now we've got Timothy. No. Usually we judge it to mean that the Apostle Paul led Timothy to Christ, in his, or he's been a pupil of Paul as a teacher. Or both is what I think most figure. Her husband was a prophet of God, a disciple of Elisha. And now he's dead. Her husband was, we're told, quote, Elisha's servant. And he was a man, we're told, that, quote, feared God. Thy, thy servant, see, thy servant, Elijah, my husband is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. She says to Elijah, and she knows Elijah is a man of God who uh, 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 works, works of miracles. And God is with him. And she says to Elijah, you know my husband Feared the Lord. Now, for her to say that, she isn't just like trying to put a good, uh, you know, uh, polish the apple of her husband to get something out of Elisha. She knew that had to be true. She couldn't say otherwise to him. She knew that. He was a disciple of Elisha, and he feared God. A God-fearing prophet who is a student of Elisha died and left his wife in debt to creditors. Now the creditors are coming. She says, I, I don't have any money. We'll take your two sons and they can be our slaves. They'll pay that debt. There was no safety net then. How was this woman going to survive? Without her husband? Well, she had her two sons. Well, they're going to take the two sons. Her husband's dead. First of all, she's got to mourn that loss. Secondly, he was a prophet of God, a man who feared God, and now that's testing her faith. Why did the Lord let this happen? And he was a man of God, and this is the situation she was left in, so it's going to put a black mark on his name to the community. And I, don't, I don't want my husband's name to be brought into question. And she's, she's stressed about that. I'm trying to put myself in her shoes. That's what she would do. That's how she would think. And now they say, we're going to come take your sons and make them our slaves. And so, first of all, I lose my husband. I'm going to lose my sons. And what's going to become of them? And then what's going to become of me? She couldn't submit a social security form. She 
She couldn't go, you know, I'm going to run down to the, the mall and see if I can get a job working as a cash register. You know, it just wasn't that way. Not then, not in that section of the world. Women were dependent upon their husbands and their sons. She could die. I mean, that, you add all that up, that's an awful lot of stress. This widow was under great distress. It says in verse 1, Now there cried a certain woman. So I said, well, just to make sure. <clears throat> so I look up that word cried. And the, the Hebrew word is sorak. So in Strong's, it defines it this way. And I was a little bit surprised, the, the extremity to which it described it. Strong's described that word as, quote, to shriek. Shriek, to cry out. And then it also went on to explain, it's also used in a more generic sense of uh, like crying out to call an assembly. So the town crier, you know, hear ye, hear ye, a meeting by the, with the king in the town square, you know, that kind of thing. So you cry out in a more generic sense. But in its most normal sense is to shriek and to cry out. That's strong. Brown Driver Briggs, lexicon, gives three definitions. And to me, they're kind of like all the same. I, I'm not sure why they're three separate ones. But number one, cry Cry out, and then parentheses, it says, for help. So this is a crying out for help, okay? That fits this situation. Second definition, absolute cry. Cry out, in parentheses, in distress and need. Well, that seems kind of the same, but yeah, that fits this situation. And then there's a third definition, make an outcry, clamor. So it sounded like it's noisy and it's... <laughs> but you get the word, which tells me it isn't she cried out. See, that she cried out. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elijah. She cried out unto him. So we know that this widow was not just concerned, worried on the inside. It seems even just from that word, never mind the circumstances, she felt desperate. Her emotions were on display. I think she felt like she was at the end of a rope, and wasn't she? So let's analyze her, and I'd ask you, how would you say that she's handling this spiritual crisis? And the way I would answer it, try to, to try to be prudent in an answer, well, I think she's on the edge. I think she's on the edge. She was at her breaking point, put it that way. I wouldn't say she crossed it, but she's on her breaking point. And maybe she can hear that voice unspoken, but she can hear it deep in the recesses of her mind. Where is now your God? So that's her situation. Now, verse 2. And Elijah said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thy handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Okay, so there's, not, there's no food in the house. There's nothing of any value that anybody would want. Yeah, she's, down, she's stripped down to nothing. A pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow thee, borrow thee. <laughs> Ask other people if you can borrow stuff from them. And she's already feeling pretty humbled. Borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few, get as many as you can. And when thou art come in, Thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shalt pour out into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her 
and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet, bring me yet another, another vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Just like Elijah said. Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, Go, sell the oil and pay thy debt. The creditors, the electric bill, the taxes, the insurance money. Keep your sons, don't lose them. No more debt. And then he says, And live thou and thy children on the rest. There would be so much left over. They would be able to, we don't know the, how much time, I don't know what that means, but live on the rest. Ooh. Her godly, responsible, God-fearing husband. Now, it turns out now, but let's back up again. Her godly, responsible, prophet husband who had just died, who feared God and followed Elisha, left her in debt. She did not seem spiritually prepared for the fullness of all this at once. Those, it seems that she did believe. I don't question that. She came to Elisha for help. But she's crying out desperately. She's at the end of her rope. And then Elijah says, he only requires one thing, one act of faith. Go and borrow from all your neighbors empty vessels and take that little bit of oil you have and pour it out in all of them. What? She just goes and does it. And when she does, <laughs> all her fears and worries are resolved. Every single one. So I thought about this very basic lesson and the lessons we extract from it. <clears throat> and it's worth mulling over for a bit. You see, brethren, we can depend upon the Lord but sometimes it's necessary to wait upon him. And that's what we call depending him and trusting him. Waiting is trusting. Not waiting anymore is not trusting. Some, but sometimes when we say depend upon the Lord, trust the Lord. But sometimes trust means wait. And sometimes that wait can be a long time. Longer than we think is necessary. But guess what? We don't see everything as man. We're mortal human beings. The Lord sees. He knows what's best. Not us. So we wait and trust. Let me ask you some questions now to get you thinking. Um, was the prophet that died and left this widow in the condition that she was left in, penniless it seems, was that prophet a man? Was he a mortal human being? I know, you know it's not a trick question. The answer is yes. If, yeah. Okay, well if he was a man like you and I, don't you think before he died, he had some concerns about how tight things were? He never thought, well, what if something happened to me? It was so tight. As he served God, don't you think he had some of those concerns? I would think so. Yeah. yeah. Let me ask you another question. Don't you think that his wife, while her husband was still alive, could see the same situation? <laughs> Before her husband passed away, that she saw the condition they're in and thought, what if something happened to my husband? Yeah, I think she could see that. I don't think he married someone that was blind. 
And because they were husband and wife and they were living on the edge that way, and she was, and he was the man of God, don't you think as husband and wife sometimes they talked about it? Well, we think, you know, we make these like mythical characters, the cartoon characters. Now, wait a minute. Think about them as humans. Of course they talked about it as husband and wife. I mean, I don't know how it happened, but, you know, I can imagine, you're right, you're laying in bed, you say, you know, we owe those creditors and there's not enough money to pay the next installment for the land we're renting or whatever the deal was. I know, honey, but, uh, you know, the Lord will provide. Something will happen. The Lord's always provided. She goes, no, I know, you're right. You know, and they're, and they're both worried, but they both believe. And they do believe, but they're worried. And they talk about it to themselves. And they think when they do, well, how come other couples don't have this conversation? How come we're having it? But they don't say that to each other because they know we don't think that way. But the flesh is thinking that way. But their hearts and minds are. But they, it's there. And they're worried. And the husband says, so the, Lord will, the Lord will make a way. She says, you're right, he will. And they hug each other and kiss each other, and when they hold each other, they, they feel better about it, you know. It's true, yeah. And he goes off to do his prophet work the next day. And what, during the day, she, she begins to worry about it again. And as he's traveling to do his prophet work, he has it in the back of his mind. And this could go on for years. That's a lot of... Burden. They're human beings, brethren. So they would reassure each other and they would talk about this on occasion. And then one day, because they would always say, the Lord will make a way. Yes, you're right. And then one day, all of a sudden, he's not moving. He's dead. died there's no financial resolution we, we, we thought there would be I got no way to pay the bills he's the prophet of God we put our trust in him the stress just got a lot higher she thought it was high before she was it would seem to me when she came to Elijah yeah, at the breaking point. But remember, a bruised reed, he shall not break. Now I know that when that's quoted in the Gospels, they're quoting Isaiah, and in both passages, are talking about Jesus. That's true. That passage, a bruised reed shall he not break, is talking about Jesus. But if that is the nature of Jesus, you can be sure it's the nature of the Heavenly Father because they weren't looking to Jesus back then. They didn't know who Jesus was yet. They were putting their trust in the Father. But if this was the nature of Jesus, you can be sure it would be the nature of the Father because Christ is one with the Father. And Jesus said, I will only say what my Father would have me say and do what my Father would have me do. So if that's the way Jesus is, you know that's the way the Father is. A broken reed, he will not break. So, let's see what really happened. Let's see the wisdom of God. Don't you think, through the way this miracle ended out in the very end, don't you think that this widow now had a greater appreciation for God's sovereign providential care for her. She was always the wife of the prophet. And her husband would say, the Lord will provide. And she did believe that. And she was reassured by her husband. And then her husband died. Oh, it's like, no, nah, I'm second fiddle. If the Lord wouldn't do it for my husband. The Lord wasn't going to fix this problem while her husband was around. Well, he waited. Yeah, this would make her hurt more. 
but the lesson would be more permanent and more powerful. Don't you think she would learn in a very real and tangible way God's care over her, even though her husband's not around? If he did it when the husband was around, she could say, after the husband dies, well, maybe the Lord blessed us, you know, for his, his sake. She won't wonder that now. Don't you think that would give her greater peace and security? For the rest of her life on earth, even though her husband's dead, after this has happened, the Lord's watching me. And if, I can't say this, but if her husband could have looked down and watched this unfold from Abraham's bosom <laughs> at that point, if, she, if he could look and see how the Lord was bringing resolution, don't you think that would have made that husband the happiest man to say, die, you know, I died, and, I, and as soon as I uh, woke up next to Abraham, oh, my poor wife, you know, and, but then watch this. And <laughs> he would say, it couldn't be any better. That's the, an unbelievably wise and gracious move because now she's going to know and that's what he wants her to have that absolute peace that assurance once he's gone she's going to be taken care of and it's the Lord watching over and that what they talked about in bed when they worried was true in a bigger way than they ever thought see before you put it in that perspective it's like this is just a sad heart-rending, sorry thing that can shake your faith. And we should all chastise ourselves and say, oh, ye of little faith. Didn't God know best? Yeah, he did. So Ethel Wallace he used to come to this assembly she left her when she she uh, when she passed away. She left her home and her property to Pastor Cugini, and, uh, and that was like a few years before Pastor Cugini died. I can't remember exactly how long, but a few years before Pastor Cugini died, that's what happened. She died, and she left her house to Pastor Cugini, and I was familiar with that uh, whole situation. Well, then Pastor Cugini died, and. You know, first of all, that's taken me for a loop. Okay, Pastor Cugini, my mentor, he died, you know, all of a sudden, you know. And, uh, I, you know, I had to go through all my stresses that I was describing this morning at that time. But I was thinking about her. I'm thinking, you know. Now, I knew that they would have money from that house that they would be able to live off. And now, but I felt like this is Pastor Cugini's widow. So what am I supposed to do? Nothing? If, 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 let's say I didn't know that. What would we do? Well, we're not made of money here at Clayville. So I said, you know what? So we, we, the elders talked about it, and we decided let's give Mrs. Cugini three months of her husband's salary now that he's dead as just a token of recognition or appreciation. So we decided to do that. So I went to a house... Um, you know, the check made out for three months' worth of what we would have paid her husband. You know, in one sense, I'd say three months. I mean, you can't, you know. But I knew she, they had money in the bank from that. But it was, it was a token, a recognition. We just had to do it, you know. And we did have the money to give to her. And so I went to her house, and um, now I'm there. To, she says, oh, no, you don't need to do that, um, the Lord's provided for us. And she didn't say how. But I mean, I knew how. And I think she knew I knew. It wasn't, you know, she knew I knew. But uh, she says, the Lord has made provision. I go, well, we feel, I feel obligated. I, we just wanted to do it. I, I don't need it. She goes, well, oh, okay, you might not, but we just want to do it. And she's insistent. I go, you need to do it for me. And let me tell you something, Mrs. Cugini. I go, understand this. Once we give it to you, you can do with it whatever you want. Now, what I was basically saying, look, if you're good, you can give it all back if you want. I'm not asking you to do that, but if you're going to keep review, just take it. You can do what you want with it. We can play ping pong with it. I don't want to say it that way. And that's not how I mean it. I just, just keep it and take it and use it. And, uh, and when I said, you can do whatever you want with it, she said, okay, and I gave it to her. Now, for those 
how many people here never knew Mrs. Cugini? There's one, two, two. Okay. Mr. Cugini was like a. How do you describe her? How you like, like partly like an old school mom. You know, she was old school. She was stern, strict. Pastor Cugini's wife, you know. But she was always very pleasant. But you wouldn't know it. Like you, she sat there. She looked like a, a stone edifice, you know. Like uh, you know, you better watch yourself around her. She isn't gonna fool around. And but then when you got to talking to her. Like, oh, you know, and she was very pleasant, but she meant business, and she did. It was Mrs. Cugini one time after her husband died. We were sitting in the living room, and it was like talking to Pastor Cugini in the living room. I'm sitting there, you know, and she would always have her like her, like her house skirts. You know those house skirts? You know, like kind of in at the waist, and it came down, and it was like lots of flowers, and the short sleeve with a collar on it, and like three buttons here, and... She'd be sitting in the chair across from me, and we're talking, oh, you know, and we're having a light thing. She goes, you know, there's one thing I don't understand. What's that? She goes, I don't understand why Roger Williams ever allowed the Jews to come here. <laughs> I say, what? <laughs> Mrs. Cuccini, she didn't fool around. But uh, she was... Nice. But I watched her cry. I had never seen that happen. You don't see women like that cry. Not like a breakdown, but you know, she had her tissue and she'd tip it and she'd be sniffing and she'd take her glasses off and wipe her eyes. And as she's doing that, she's saying, um, I can't remember how exactly she said it, but she basically implied, like, and she wasn't direct about it, but she, I interpret it this way. For many years, I've always worried about how we would make it when we're old. But the Lord has provided like we knew he would and in a far greater way than I ever thought. And she, those tears were tears of humble faith and gratitude and recognition of how the Lord provided f through just another sister in the assembly that left in that house and enabled. And Pastor Cugini had the privilege of actually passing away knowing that'll be there for my wife. I remember Pastor Cugini would tell the story when he had, um, I think it was when he had one of his heart attacks, Some one of the men came in to see him, and um, he said, if anything happens to me, can you make sure my wife's okay? I can imagine Pastor Cugini having to say that. And I don't even know who he said it to. And he says, well, we'll make sure. Well, I don't know who that person ever was. They were probably gone before that happened. <laughs> I'm figuring it was one of the people that left. <laughs> but um, I don't know, Lord provider in a way. Wally, we used to call her Wally, Ethel Wallace. She'd drive here in a big, like, old 98, something like that, a New Yorker, or old 98, snowing out. No one comes, but she comes with a two-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive, you know, boat with the, the, you could fit a family of six under the hood and a family of ten in the trunk. She never said a word, never said a peep. She made the cassettes for the victory hour. And when Pastor Cugini had his heart attack, she said, um, and he'd come over to drop off some more sermons for her to make copies of. She says, uh, so you, when you're at the hospital there, um, did they give you a bill? Yeah, she goes, just... You know, bring it next time you come. She paid it. You know, they never knew what was going to happen to them. They were living on a wire. And those tears of Miss Cugini, which were very, you know, they like burnt in my memory. Hard to watch, you know. But they were nice because they were tears of joy and humble faith and appreciation and I mean, probably a little bit of like, you know, 
any worry that we had through those years was useless. Like, that's what I always say, right? Like, oh, all the time you spent worrying was for no good reason, right? Fret not. Well, they don't take it for caught. But you know, we're human. We, we do. So how do you overcome trials and temptation? It's just as simple as this. By trusting the Lord. See how simple that lesson is? For profoundly true in the most basic forms of temptation. You can have, be sick with worry or have peace. It all boils down to faith. Let's bow our heads in order of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for your word and for your truth and for your grace and for your kindness, your trustworthiness, your honor. We ask forgiveness for our doubts and our fears, our lack of faith, our lack of trust. We pray, Father, that thou would give us the peace that passes all understanding, which can only come through the exercise of faith, which is a gift from thee. May we take down all the barriers that are between ourselves and the fullness of that gift. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.